Okay. So last Sunday, we looked at uh, a number of scriptures on faith and healing and how these two things are really connected or intertwined. And uh, so whether it was uh, about an individual's faith, right, or the faith of a friend or a family member, or even of kind of like the master or an employer, if you like. Um, well, we also talked about church leaders, right? James and James 5, where he talks about if the leaders of the church pray for you, if you come to them and they pray for you, and you do a prayer in faith, you'll be healed. So there's all these examples of how Jesus healed those who believed in him as the son of David, right? The, the Messiah, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And often when Jesus healed, if you remember, he said things like, um, your sins are forgiven, right? And go and sin no more. And when he said that, and when he did these healings, it was a reflection of his godhood, right? Because um, only God could heal in that miraculous way. So they proved that he was sent by the Father, that he had a, the authority um, over all heaven and earth, over all creation. So continuing on this topic of faith and healing, um, let me say that there's a lot of variance in view, right? So don't get mad at me. Um, but if my view differs from yours, that's okay, right? Like, we're all trying to figure this out together. And we come from different backgrounds. And, and it's, so I never want when I go through these topics, which can be really divisive, and how we view, whether it's eschatology or, or healing, that we would then get mad because I don't agree with you or you don't agree with me. Okay. So we're just going to go through it and talk about kind of the real polar opposites of the scale and then um, work back to the middle. All right, because there is a very differing views on healing and what that looks like in the modern church. So on one end of the scale, you could we use the label as cessationists, right? This idea that um, they don't believe that Jesus heals anymore but that healing was specific to the time of Jesus and to the time of the apostles in order to start and build the church, right? So Jesus healed and apostles healed. They, people saw that. They believed then that Jesus was the Messiah, was God, and they turned to them in faith, and, and it began the church. But after they were gone, the church was in going forward. They had accomplished, if you like, the original purpose in healing, and so that's how they view that. And a cessationist would also say that there are no more gifts of the Spirit among us, that that was for that time, and that's no more. Now, I'm generalizing, and I'm kind of pushing on the extreme end, okay? So, now, on the other end of the scale would be those who believe that not only does Jesus still heal, and we would say they're, uh, they were continuationists, that this, that Jesus has never stopped healing and that he continues to heal, but that he has given us the authority to heal. Okay? So they would say, in a real sense, as his followers, that we, we are his representatives on this earth and have his power within us to act on behalf of him in the world. So those on this end of the scale would suggest that it is not God's will in any way for anyone to be sick or crippled or ill, right? That um, we can then pray in confidence, knowing his will, that everyone is, should be healthy. Um, and that's what Jesus wants. And so that's, he wants everyone well. And so we pray in confidence in that knowledge. So there, I've, I've now I've generalized on the other end of the scale, right? I've just pushed the two ends. Just, I'm gonna do that on purpose. Um, just so we can kind of see this, this thing, right? We do this all the time in the church. Man, we've been doing it since he, Jesus was here, right? We've got these diverse views and these really kind of polar ends and then everything in between. And there is a lot in between. So, so my view, based on my journey with the Lord, which we all have, right? Um, based on my bias and, and through the, the, my studying the scriptures, is definitely not cessationist, okay? I do not uh, believe that the Lord has stopped working at any point, but it's also not on that other far end of the scale, 
Okay. So let's talk first of all about cessationism and, and why I, I don't think it works and why I don't think it's biblical that, that God's not working anymore. That, um, and I guess they wouldn't say it that way. Hebrews 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. He does not change. God has not changed. He is unchanging. So Jesus has always intervened in the world of man, and he continues to do so. So I, I can't see how it, it works to say he's not working in the world anymore. So then you would have to say he's not resurrected, he's not a body, he's not sitting at the right hand of the Father, he's not hearing our prayers, he's not whatever, right? Take it to the extreme. Um, and so, so I think to deny that Jesus is intervening in the world, in our lives, is to deny millions of people's experience and to deny biblical evidence. So and another reason, and this kind of leads to another reason I don't believe in cessationism is, is because of the work of the Holy Spirit. So John 16, 13 to 15 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So the Holy Spirit even does not speak on his own authority, but on the authority from God the Father and Jesus. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All right. So we know that the Holy Spirit is in every believer, and he is there to convict us, right, of sin, of the things that, that um, are against others and against God that cause us to be separated from God, if you like. He's our teacher, our guide, and he empowers us to live in this world. Well, how can he do that if it's not happening in our life, if it's not right manifest in our life, then that's not happening. Then there's no guide, there's no teaching, there's no convicting. So in that alone, we see uh, that God is continually working in the world and the lives of his people. And so it's, I like that the, this verse says that through Holy Spirit, Jesus speaks to us, that he is speaking to us, telling us things to come, of things to come, and empowers us with gifts as well. And this leads us to 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 9. And I'm just going to mention some of the gifts that are more where we're at today. So it says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So the gifts are for, not for you, not for me, to for my own edification, but so that you are blessed, right? And you are lifted up and you are healed, You are, all those things, Okay. For one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. Okay. So isn't that interesting? We're told by the Lord that faith is a gift, that you cannot believe in God, you cannot believe in Jesus Christ as God, unless... Basically, the Holy Spirit has, has enabled you to do so, right? So it's not all about yourself and your own wisdom and your own figuring it out and all of that. There's a as huge aspect of coming to faith in Jesus Christ that is about God himself working in your mind and your heart to bring about that understanding. Um, but it says there is a special gifting of faith that some people are gifted with faith, that they just trust in God in all situations, in all ways, in every aspect, and they probably couldn't even explain why. They just do. I don't know. That's one way of saying it, I guess. Some, it says, receive the gift of healing. Well, I know people amongst us and others who have a passion and a desire to pray for others for healing. It's just who they, they believe. It's what God has called them to do. And they have seen that bear fruit. And, and it, it's just, they have a burden. They have a burden to pray for others for healing, for the suffering and the ill. 
I have not yet found a verse of Scripture that suggests that the gifts of the Spirit or the work of the Holy Spirit in people has stopped or will stop. Now, I think when Jesus returns, that won't be necessary anymore, right? I don't know how that'll look, um, but so I would say one other proof against cessationism is the uh, this basically the great number of documented and undocumented cases of miraculous healings, right? I mean, just throughout the age, there's so many. I think the whole thing of cessation came about by Protestantism, by the Protestant movement as kind of a rebellion or a, a move against the Catholic Church, who was really promoting uh, the aspects of healing and likely doing so through the name of Mary in a lot of ways, right? By praying to Mary, praying to the saints and all of that. And, the, and so the early Protestants really developed, this is where this really formulated, almost as a pushback, right? Um, it's, and we'd see that, we have seen that quite a bit in, in that move of Protestantism, where they kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater to be really separate and to kind of put themselves apart. And that's too bad um, because we, we've lost a lot in that process. I think many of you have a personal story or the story of a friend or a family member or someone else who was healed in unexplainable ways. That makes no other sense other than they prayed, others prayed, and the Lord healed them, right? So I have that story in one sense when I came to faith. It was like seventh day into this journey of me and the Lord and him helping me and, and guiding me and bringing me along. And he gave me a choice, right? I was 25 years chronic, heavy pot smoker daily, okay? Like every single day for 25 years, work, rain, snow, fun, whatever it was, that was me. And I didn't think I could do anything or survive without it. Okay. The Lord said, do you want that? You want to go back to that? Or do you want to continue in the journey that you've had with me in these last seven days? And I said, Lord, take it away. And it was gone. You have to understand something. You think, okay, pot's not a great, uh, is not a necessarily a, a, as addictive as other things. It's hugely psychologically addictive. And it just takes a lot longer to get out of your, your body, out of your fat cells and everything, many more days. And so it's, it, it's easier if you like physically in some ways, right? Um, but I never had a single craving, a single desire. I remember having dreams six months later, later being upset with myself because I in the dream, I smoked a joint and I was upset. And I woke up sure I had done it. And I was upset at myself. But see, for me, it wasn't, a, I, couldn't, I couldn't control it, right? I, there was no aspect of control, and that's another issue. He does heal in miraculous ways. He could have healed other stuff in my life. I'm not sure why he chose to only, you know, do that. I want to go back to James really quick, James 5. Um, and if anyone um, is among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. I just find that to be such a powerful verse of Scripture. Fairly, if you do this, 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 right, then, then I will. Um, so and then this is the last question I'll kind of ask about cessation. Why would James, who we pretty much all believe was Jesus' brother, James, who wrote the book of James, why would he say then, long after Jesus' death, to the early church, that if you pray for each other, those who pray in faith, will the sick will be healed. If that stopped at some point, I mean, James and the apostles were still mostly there when he wrote this, but he's writing to the church, right? Um, so he's saying, you know, ex expect this. This is an expectation. Um, so obviously, the early church believed that people were healed in Jesus' name. Okay. Now, here are some of the reasons why the other end of the scale view, which in some ways I think appropriates the power and authority of Jesus upon oneself. And I think that's the part that concerns me. Um, and it, it could just be perception on my part too. So again, don't be upset with me. If, if you're on that end, don't, don't, no, no tomatoes, please. 
And and the, the reason, I'm going to have a few reasons for this. And uh, remember this too, we're all growing, right? Me included. And so what I'm saying right now in 10 years may change. I may feel different about it. I may see something else in the scriptures and I may grow in. And so just hold on to that knowledge too. Because I think having that humility to understand that we don't, each of us have it all figured out is really important. Acts 14. Um, Again, I talked about this last Sunday, Paul and Barnabas in, are in Lystra, and there's this guy who's crippled, and there's hundreds of people around, apparently, right, in the center square, wherever they are, and uh, he's crippled in his feet, he can't walk, he can't stand. Paul, it says, Paul sees that he has the faith to be healed, and he says the words, get up and walk, and this guy jumps up and starts bouncing around and praising, you know, it's interesting because um it's it's not a lot is explained about it well the people in Lystra, Lystra think that they're gods they think that they're zeus and artemis and they're gonna so they run the priests run and go get bulls and stuff to make a sacrifice right there because these guys are god come down from heaven they just healed this guy which they have not seen in their reality and in acts 14 14 15 it says but when the apostles barnabas and paul heard of it they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, men, why are you doing these things? Right? We are also men. We're just men of a like nature with you. Okay? And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things, all these idols and all this crap that you're believing in, which isn't real. Right? Turn away from those and turn to a living God who just healed this guy. He's alive, living, okay? Who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. You know, Paul and Barnabas went out of their way to make sure the people knew that the healing power was from Jesus and by his name, not by a human being. In fact, they say, we are all men of like nature with you, right? The only difference is they intimately know and understand Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and rely on him in all things, and have the Holy Spirit guiding them and teaching them and speaking to them and all of that. But they were not gods, and they were not even appropriating the power of God, who they were servants of, right? They were see themselves as servants of God Most High. So there was a great sense of humility that I really admire within them, because they, they, they fully understood that they were merely cooperative partners with God by his grace and his mercy. And, and they loved that, right? That they had that opportunity. And, and that kind of leads me to Romans 12, where then Paul, speaking again, says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Not to think with, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. That one confuses me. Is there different measures of faith? And does God assign them? Isn't that interesting? He assigns them. You don't manifest a different measure of faith. He assigns them. Now, it does also talk in other scriptures that we can grow in faith. So, it's an interesting dynamic. So it is difficult for me when I hear other believers make really bold statements about appropriating the, the power of Christ in this world as, you know, to do things. Um, because I've witnessed it, and along with it has come like a spirit of judgment. And, and that's the part that concerns me. Um, so even if the words are not said, there's an implication that, let's say, um, I prayed for someone and they weren't healed. Well, they, they, may, they, must not, they must be lacking in faith. Or maybe there's some unrepented sin in their life or something like that, right? And I, I'm just saying, I've experienced that personally in situations, and it's been very harmful for the person who was being prayed for. Because there was an element within that, whether it's in, intended or not, that they were more spiritual than the person they were praying for. 
that that's my concern when it comes the wrong way right when it's not done with this incredible love and grace and humility and all of the things that the lord says paul says also in romans 14 therefore let us not pass judgment judgment on one another any longer but re rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother right we need to just be really sensitive and careful to each other as we do things if you're praying for someone and they don't want you to pray in tongues for them back off right like be sensitive to that cuz not everyone is comfortable with that and understands it or you know in the way that you might and so the, just things like that is what i'm talking about and but i you know what I, I know this is not true of the majority of of you who walk in that understanding i know that um again i'm you know we make these generalizations and we make the statements it it is about more on the extreme okay that i'm talking about And so the other thing that I guess concerns me about that end is that if we have the same authority now on, on earth to continue on with Jesus' work, right? And that focus seems to be mostly on healing is what it comes out as, okay? Why is not everyone being healed? And I ask that question because of this. Jesus never failed to heal a single person he set out to heal. Not a one if you think of Matthew 4, and I think that was the passage that we read, the scripture we read, and he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures, seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And faith isn't in that passage anywhere. Now, it, it should be assumed or presumed, right, that these people had faith to believe in him. Just because it doesn't mention it doesn't mean that that's not part of that aspect. But Jesus had the power to heal people, whether they had the faith or not. So if we have the same authority, shouldn't we be able to heal those we set out to heal? So Jesus' healing was based on his power, his authority, and not just on the faith those he healed, right? He's God. He, he, it's, it supersedes all of that. So it's that classic thing, question, right? Like, well, So why can't we walk into hospitals and heal the sick? Why can't we go into a place, a Christian hospital, with many Christian believers who are ill and who have great faith and believe in the Lord, and we pray for them, but they don't recover? Why? I don't know. What are we missing? I guess is my question then. So what are we missing? Because that's a reality, right? It's true. And why did the Apostle Paul, why did he ask, basically beg the Lord three times to be healed? And then Jesus said to him, his desire was that, no, no, you, you, you're going to be left with this in, infirmity or this struggle. That would seem to say, that no, he does not always desire all things to be healed or to always for everyone to be made well. Even when you think about when he was still Saul and he was on the road to Damascus and Jesus blinded him to get his attention, <laughs> right? Will Jesus do something to you to get your attention? Oh, yeah, right? Now, he also healed him of that. He uses Ananias, right? But he said to Ananias, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my namesake. Well, that's an interesting statement. He said Paul was going to suffer in his life in order to glorify me. Okay. And then I think of all the poor and those who are martyred for their faith, who have devoted their lives to serving Christ and are glorious, wonderful people, amazing, loving people of faith. And yet the Lord did not preserve them from those things. So if he did not you know, change that in their life, then that must be in his will. All right. No tomatoes yet. We're doing good. I, I love it that I can do this and then it could create a debate amongst us that's not difficult. You know what I mean? Not um, 
mean or whatever else. And then we can grow all of us together in more knowledge and understanding. I believe, having said all of this that I just said, I believe there is an absolute biblical mandate to pray for others from our hearts and to do so in Jesus' name. Absolutely. Okay? So don't get me wrong if you think I'm... Uh, I also believe that the power and authority resides in Jesus Christ, my Savior and my King. And His purpose and His reasons for healing are not are His and not mine. And, and I, I don't get to know all of that. I don't. There is that Weaver poem. Have you ever heard the Weaver poem? That we're looking at the underside of this tapestry. And you know how the underside of a tapestry doesn't make sense? But the upper side does. You can see the patterns. You can see the beauty. You can see it's a flower. Well, I couldn't tell that from underneath. And so we see the underside, and, or we see through a, a mirror dimly, if you like, right? And so there's also the truth that there is no doubt in my mind that having a positive attitude as we pray and we, and we uh, put our faith in Jesus is important, that he talks about that. He says that we should be um, believing that he will answer the prayer made in faith, right? In Mark 11, he says, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Okay. So he's saying, have an attitude and a mindset where you trust in me and you believe in me, right? So when you pray, do so not with doubt not with disbelief. In another place it says, then you'll be like a person tossed to and fro on the waves, right? So no, trust in, in what you're praying for. And it says we are to make those prayers specifically and by the power of the name, pardon me, the name of Jesus, just as Paul and Barnabas did, right? They went out of the way, hey, this is by the power in the name of Jesus Christ. So John 14 says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that my Father may be glorified in the Son. Again, a very powerful verse. Whatever you ask in my name. Okay, so there's my question. Does this merely mean that uh, I just say Jesus' name at the end of the prayer? Lord Jesus, help Cameron, heal Cameron. In Jesus' name, I pray. And bing, bang, that happens, right? The prayer happens. It's done. Or is there a deeper context going on here and a meaning to asking in his name or other places say in his will? Is there a deeper context? Is it about long-term relationship, about trust being built between you and the Lord, about faith, about circumstance, about the Lord having something else maybe that he's doing in that person's life we don't know about? All of these things, right? And so we don't just tack on the end, in Jesus' name, and it's going to happen. Because that may actually be using his name in vain. So think about that. Be careful how you use his name. And I, I suggest that this must be, right, this idea that we just don't tack on his name, that there's something deeper going on, because otherwise it ends up we who are in control instead of God. If I just got to tack his name on the end and he does what I want, who's in control? What am I saying about my relationship with God and how I view him? Um, so when we do that, we have made God our servant instead of his, us being his humble servant. So now there are indeed passages that speak about us having or receiving authority of Jesus to be his ambassadors in the world right? You have Luke 9, and he speaks to the 12, and he says, I called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and then he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And then in Matthew 10, and I remember this verse from very, all on, very early on in my faith journey, and it really stuck with me, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paling or freely you have received really give. That really impacted me. Because when you've been healed by Jesus, 
and your life has been restored to you, if you like, in this profound way, you have this burden, right, that others might understand that, and you could be part of that, partnering in that. Now, these words were spoken to the Twelve, and there is some truth that we can appropriate the words Jesus spoke to the Twelve, right? They're not just toward, to the Twelve, but we got to be careful. We got to be careful to to take things said and, and power given to the apostles is also just automatically being for us. Um, so I urge caution when we read a passage to remember who was it written to, in what time, in what context, for what reason, why did Jesus say that to those people before? It's like we take Old Testament passages all the time, right? And we tap them on the wall and we, we pray that and that's for me. And it's the classic Jeremiah 31 kind of thing, right? I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper, not to harm plans for hope in the future. Okay, what's the context of that verse? Israel going through 70 years of being out of their nation, struggling in great many ways before the Lord restores them. So we appropriate the nice part, the part we really like, and we don't want to talk about, but first, you're going to go through the I almost said the word. <laughs> you're going to go through it really, you know, you're going to get rung through the ringer a bit here. And then I'm going to bring you back and bless you. Okay. Which is a verse that we can appropriate if we understand the truth of it. Life is going to be hard. Life is going to be dangerous. You're going to have struggles. People are going to come against you, et cetera, et cetera. But don't forget, I love you. I'm the good, good father. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to bring you back. To myself. So always we got to be careful to just appropriate a verse and say, this applies to us right now in our lives as a believer. Um, I, and I don't believe Jesus passed on his, his authority in any way. I believe he still has complete authority over all things in heaven and earth. If we look at Matthew 28, just before he ascended, he said, Jesus came to them and said to them, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Done, plain, simple. And it's interesting because afterwards, he did not speak to them about going out and healing. This is the last opportunity he had to talk to the apostles, okay? And the most important thing that he spoke about was ma making disciples, baptizing, and teaching them to follow his commands, to believe and follow him. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't want us to be praying for healing, right? On the contrary, but his main purpose was that he wants us to partner with him in saving souls, in helping people understand about Jesus Christ and coming into the kingdom. It, this is the truth. Jesus desires us to partner with him in his ministry of reconciliation to be part of that. He, he loves it when we come along with him. And it's something that I, I learned really early on. It's not my ministry. It's not your ministry. It is Jesus' ministry, because he's active and alive and working in all of our lives and in the lives of others. And we have the privilege and the honor that he says, come with me. I, I want you to be part of this ministry. In fact, I want to even use you in this ministry, because that's how I choose to operate because I love you guys, and, and I want you to be part of this, and I need you to be part of this, because it's what I've designed every, how everything to work, right? And so healing is part of that, but it's secondary to salvation, if I can say that. You know, I'm quite certain, in fact, I'm very certain that Jesus would rather have a person come crippled into the kingdom than not at all. I dare say sometimes he might even cripple them to bring them into the kingdom. <laughs> so, because the great hope and the promise is that someday we'll all receive a perfect body, undefiled and without pain. Uh, and so I ag agree with a great many of you when you say, or you proclaim that you are healed, even as your body is failing. I understand that because once we are in Christ Jesus, we're forgiven. It's done deal. We've been redeemed. We've been made new. In fact, we are told we are a new creation, literally. We're not the same as we were. And that may be hard for you to understand if that hasn't happened in your life. 
it's, there's a there's a change in your mind and a change in your heart and a change in your priorities and your desires. And then we know we're going to have a resurrected perfect body someday without all the pain that we will be whole, right? That we will be whole. But what I don't agree with is the syncretism that's come into the church of the power of positive thinking. It's invaded the church and it is not a biblical understanding. Um, I'm, I, I'm fairly strong on that. And I don't like the way it's crept into church theology. And it's not because you claim that you are healed, that you are healed. It's not because you say it over and over again, like a mantra. And it's not because you somehow manifest the faith enough to believe. It's not about that. You are healed solely and purely by the power and the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's where healing comes from. If it doesn't, then anybody in the world at any time following any God for any reason can heal. And we don't see that. The faith you have to be healed is faith in Jesus as the one who can forgive sins. The one, well, I love that world, the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. That's what our faith is in. Not in me, not in you, not in the world, not in medicine. So when we say um, he, they had the faith to believe, what it's saying is they trusted that Jesus was the Messiah. They understood that's who he was. That's the faith that they had. Not some kind of, somehow we go, some seem to, and I do this too, sometimes we think, oh, it's a mental thing. I, you know, like faith is in here. And it's something I manifest by my own will and by my own power and by my mental acuity. If you are healed, it's because it was his, in his will. And he desired for you to be healed. And it has something to do with his purpose. If you're not healed, it's because it's in his will and for his purpose. It's, it's really simple for me in those ways. That's not my responsibility and not my problem. I would love it if everybody was healed and there was no more pain and all of that. And I pray for that from my heart. That's my desire, right? You know, remember, even the most godly of people like Paul were not healed of all their ailments or their struggles. And Paul says, right, we all have many troubles of many kinds. I'm sure there's every one of us here with the Lord. I would just love you if you would heal me of this fill in the blank right now. And he says, no, no, I'm not going to do that. No. And I think sometimes it's because he needs us to struggle through that. And in the struggle, when we're failing, what do we do? We turn back to him and we're reminded how much we need him. We're reminded how we can't do this journey on our own and how we need his help. Maybe that's the purpose. So, you, and you may not like it, but I believe biblical evidence, common sense, and the experience of millions of Christians attest to this truth that Jesus heals, but not everyone is healed, not all the time. And I guess all I'm saying is let's be careful and not fall into kind of pridefulness or to certain attitudes. Um, of thinking too highly of ourselves, as Paul says, of not being humble and gracious and kind and loving and generous and, and beautiful in our spirits. That's what people respond to. That's what the Lord loves and responds to, right? Um, I know in my heart that Jesus is alive and actively working in this world. I know that for a fact. I'm, I, I'm a testament to that. I know the gifts of the Spirit are real and are given to every believer for the edification of the body. That's real. That has not stopped. Um, I know that Jesus has all authority and power to heal and that he does so now in this moment, right now in this world. And he does so amongst stuff. And, and we've witnessed, witnessed that. And I know we should pray with all our hearts for the healing of our brothers and sisters and then have the confidence in faith in Jesus that he is going to do something meaningful and effective, right? And I just have the faith to continue and believe in Jesus as my, my king, my high priest, my Lord. And regardless of the outcome of my prayers, regardless of the state of this body, regardless of what happens, my faith is in him. It's in him and in his righteousness.
Amen. Okay. Amen. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much, everyone. And uh, you can pray with me as I'm, I'm looking at this next idea of faith and healing and the stories of so many of you. Um, well, you lost a child after tons of prayer and all the rest when um, something else happened that wasn't the way that you would have liked it. And, and I want to talk about that. Why is that? How do we deal with that? How do we go forward trusting in God, putting our faith in God in an even greater way through those circumstances in life? Um, and how do we understand that? And uh, so that's kind of where I want to go next. So I just need the, your prayers and the Lord's help so that we can all maybe have a better understanding of that. Uh, it's that classic question, if a loving God, why then pain and misery, etc., etc. right? And so um, from here, I just pray that you would go and in all the things that you do, you would represent the Lord our God and Savior in a beautiful and miraculous way where people would see you and take joy in you and in the, in the knowledge that there is a God who is good. And so I just pray um, in, in Jesus' name from my heart and that this would be the truth in all of our lives. So that may the Lord bless and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you and give you his peace. Amen.